You're listening to the KB Podcast Network. <laughs> hey guys, this is Darren. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast today. It is my desire to build up and encourage the children of God to be everything they were created to be. If you're interested in more content like this, please check out kingdombringer.com. Thanks so much. Enjoy the episode. Hey, what's going on, Kingdom Bringers? How you guys doing? It is good to be here. I'm back, kinda. Took a little break on a little hiatus. Still not fully going, going, going yet with the podcast, but I'm excited to be here right now. Here's the deal. I, I gave a message this weekend at Will Rhodes Gardens Christian Church here in Dodge City. And it was about taking people from information to activation, wanting to get you guys activated in your kingdom identity from information to activation. And I feel like I laid it out pretty well as far as the process that there is for us to fully be activated in the kingdom of God when it comes to knowing our identity, living out this kingdom. And I wanted to share it with you. I wanted to share it with you. This can also be found on the Well Revival Hub podcast. You can find that on Apple, Google, Spotify, anywhere you guys listen to podcasts. You can find it on there. The Well Revival Hub. Look for it there. We're going to be uploading our weekly messages to that. But I also wanted to share it here on this platform. Uh, Not everybody is aware of the, the Well Revival Hub podcast yet but it's out there and you can check it out for future messages. It's going to be our, our message of the week will be on there and yeah, we just want to build you up and encourage you and that's it. I'm going to get right into this thing. This is called from information to activation. This is a sermon I gave this weekend and hope you guys are blessed today. Hope you guys are blessed by this. Enjoy. Thank you, Colton. Thank you, Earl. I'm not going to make you stand up, but will you grab the hand of the person next to you? Unless you're Jeremy Davis and sitting all alone. Somebody grab that young man. Somebody grab that young man. He was about to cry, it looked like. Bless him, Lord. This is a family, and it goes so far beyond these walls, but the family of God is so amazing. Do you realize that what evangelism is? He talked about prophecy. Evangelism is inviting people into the family of God, and we should be able to represent that well, and we don't sometimes. I don't. You guys are my brothers and my sisters, and I don't know some of you very well at all, and I take responsibility for that. Like for real. I want to know you guys. I want you guys to know each other. This is a family. Grab the hand next to you. Thank you, Father, for this family that you have so beautifully put together. Some of us are really ugly. Some of us are better looking than others. He's speaking about himself. I said us and we. But God, we are so thankful. And we ask you to give us that heart, that spirit of thankfulness for the family of God. Thankfulness for the family of God. Every single one of them. Thank you, Father, for the person right next to us right now that we're holding hands with. That we've chosen to celebrate the kingdom with you today, Father. We've chosen to celebrate with this person, Father. 
And we give you the honor and the praise as a, a family matchmaker, that you're awesome at it. You're awesome at building families. You're awesome at restoring families. And from the ground up, you've built this one, and it's awesome, and it's beautiful. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Real quick, this is on my heart too. I want everybody to kind of put your hand over your heart. The family of God extends way past these four walls. Right now, I want you to have on your mind a church, another body, another congregation right now. Have that in your mind. First one that comes to your mind. Father God, we bless every church in this region. We bless every congregation, Father, that has chosen to gather in your name. Whether that's on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or three times on a Sunday, Father. We pray that your spirit flow in that room. We pray right now that your spirit have full access to every heart and every member of the family of God. We don't want to do this for nothing. So we pray that as we gather, Father, that where there's unity, that you're commanding a blessing right now. Corporately, right now, as the body of Christ, God, you're commanding the blessing, it says. Psalms 133, you command the blessing where there's unity. And we don't want to do anything that's going to go against your command, Father. We thank you for who you are and for what you're doing in every body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Woo! How y'all doing? What a beautiful day. It was cool this morning. Jason said he'd pick me up at 8.15, so guess what I did? I went out and sat on my porch at 8.15. I sat there for 25 minutes. And it was beautiful. It was cool weather. Thank God. If it was hot, I wouldn't be complaining, but I'm not. We love Jason. That was awesome. That was fun. That's my one burn, Jason, for the day. One burn. Stephen Covey. He's a a popular, he's probably not too popular because none of you probably know who he is. He's a speaker and an author. He he made a statement that I, I think is pretty accurate. And for times like this in my life, it really, really speaks loud. He said, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. I want you to think about that for a minute. We see the world not as it is, but as we are. That's a, that's a, that's a, a shot at our identity in a good way. He's saying, know who you are because you're going to see the world that way. Get your identity straight because you're going to see the world that way. That's why identity was such a powerful message for us this summer. It's so important for us to know who we are, who we belong to. Because we're going to see the world through that lens. Does that make sense? And there's times that our identity shakes a little bit, right? And we lose sight of that. I do it often. Unfortunately, I feel like I'm getting more stable and more set in my identity. But the enemy is always trying to go after it for that reason right there. Because if we're walking around with a false sense of identity, we have a false sense of the world, and we're going to be accusing the brethren like we do, like he does, because he wants it that way. You know he came to divide? He he, He wants to divide and conquer. God's all about unity. He actually commands the blessing where the unity's at. Right? I want to see you guys with right eyes with a right heart and a right view. So I need to know who I am. I need to stand in that firm. Because if we have a wrong view, we can think the world is going to hell. Everything around us is crap. Because if we're looking that way and we don't have a shirt identity of who we are, that's what we're going to believe. And it's just not true. God created every single person with value and with purpose. And if I don't see myself that way, I can't see you that way. Does that make sense? That has absolutely nothing to do with anything that I have here. But it is so important. It is so important. That's why we were on identity. Because I woke up this morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. 
could not sleep. Major anxiety in my heart. And it's because of relationships that are going on in my life. And what happens when I have a wrong sense of identity, I believe things are going on that aren't going on. And that's what I'm talking about, about if, I, if I'm seeing the world in a wrong lens, I'm going to start making stuff up. This person's thinking this way when they're not. Does that make sense? Anybody been there? Yeah. It brings anxiety, and that's not in the kingdom. It brings all these things that the enemy, his goal was to shock and awe. Right? Identity crisis. He wants us to stay in that place because I'm going to see you with wrong eyeballs, right? right. I'm going to believe that you're talking about me behind my back when you're not. Because I have a false insecurity about what's going on here because I don't know who I am. Is it, any of that makes sense? Okay. Let's know who we are. We want to take you guys from a place of information to a place of activation when it comes to your identity. Information to activation. Say it with me. Say information, information to, activation. to activation. Who wants to be activated this morning? Who wants to be activated in your identity? The same way Jesus went down into that water when He was really baptized. And He comes out of the water, gets filled with the Spirit, and goes straight down to the, into the wilderness. He was activated with His identity. Right? The Lord spoke, this is My Son, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased, and He actually believed it. Jesus actually believed that, and He walked with authority and with power. A few weeks ago, we were having prayer before a worship service, and this, this verse came to my heart. Matthew 5.14, if it's up there. It's, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. That's from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking to a bunch of people. He's talking to a bunch of people. But is He talking to individuals? He's not just talking on a group corporate level. He's talking to individuals. This word is said that it will not come back void. When we speak a word, it's supposed to insert into your heart, activate and become something. Or it really wasn't a word. Right? Right? He's speaking to a bunch of individuals that make up a corporate body, the family of God, right? And so he's telling on a corporate level, he's saying you are a light in the world. You are a city. As an individual, are you a city? You're not, are you? But you can be the light in the world. Corporately, you're the city on a hill. So many times we sit back and we believe that the church is called to something, that there's some major corporate call to the church, and we're just waiting for that to happen. And we're just waiting for everybody to get their identity figured out so we can actually be a light. We'll actually sit at home and complain. The church is this and the church is that. You are a light on a hill, a city that cannot be hidden. So I think it's time for us as individuals to start becoming what we're called to be corporately. Yeah, good. It's time for us as individuals to start actually becoming what the corporate call is for the church and not sitting back and waiting for somebody else to take the lead. Does any of that make sense? Yeah. I believe that that's going to happen if there's an activation that takes place. You're actually called to be a representative of the corporate call. When Jesus is talking to the church, He says things like what? You're a salt of the earth. You're the city on a hill. Whatever else He says. He says a lot of things to the church. Paul speaks a lot of things to the church. It's time for us to actually become that as individuals because we are representatives of that corporate call. Are you with me? Are you tracking on that? Take some responsibility in that, right? you got to be activated. you got to be activated or else we're just walking around waiting for somebody else to do something. 
It's our goal in this place to get you activated so you can actually become an active member of the body of Christ. An actual participant in the family of God. Who wants to be a participant in the kingdom? And not just a spectator. I come against a spectator attitude right now in Jesus' name. Right now. All those Pharisees walking around, show me a sign, show me a sign, show me a sign. What did Jesus say? Signs and wonders will follow those who believe. So go. Quit standing here waiting for me to give you something. Go. Go. They're going to follow you if you believe in who I am. Holy cow. You guys are brothers and sisters in this family. You're brothers and sisters in this family. Here's the deal. I don't, Scott kind of hit it on earlier, and it's actually in my notes, so I'm glad you hit on it. I'm not actually here to comfort you as much as I am to spur you on. I think the church has gone wrong there in a lot of ways where these pastors have provided like comfortable shelter, padded walls, safe zones, so that we actually start to rely on the pastor more than we do on the comforter. Does that make sense? I, I believe it is my job to maybe even ruffle your feathers a little bit so that you get out of your comfort zone and start relying on the Holy Spirit. Because I'm not here to tickle your fancy. I'm not. I'm here to encourage you to something. I'm here to encourage you to something. You're not going to get tickled. I believe there's four steps to this to get from information to activation. The first one is information. The second one is revelation. The third one is the key, and it's the one that I think gets left out a lot, and that's application. And then there's activation. Everybody say it with me. Information. Information. Revelation. Revelation. Application. Application. And activation. Activation. Jason said that a few weeks ago, that application is the sign of a mature Christian. Application is the sign of a mature Christian. Many of us walk with people or we've experienced it ourselves. We don't allow ourselves to mature to that third step. We'll even take the revelation all day long. God, give me a word. Give me a word. Give me a word. The prophetic word that's going to work for you is the prophetic word that you work. I believe that the prophetic word that works for you in your life is the one that you actually work. I've had a lot of prophetic words in my life given to me that I've flushed down the toilet or I've set them on a shelf or I've allowed it to puff me up a little bit. If I don't do anything with that word and I don't put it into action, there will be no activation. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Let's do this. Let's do this. It's okay to stand on somebody else's testimony. Like that's a pretty good starting point. Would you guys agree with that? Sometimes we, we actually have to, we don't, we don't see it in our lives. We actually have to stand on somebody else's platform of testimony and launch from that place. But I promise you that it's God's desire for you to have your own testimony. For you to have your own experience. Do you agree with that? He wants you to have your own kingdom experience so that you have a platform to go from faith to faith and glory to glory and breakthrough to breakthrough and encounter to encounter. Right? Right? Activation. Let's get activated in this. Again, who's willing to be activated this morning? Let's get activated. Let's do this. Let's do this. We can do this. I know we can. Information. Revelation. Application. And activation. I got some definitions that the Lord kind of gave me for these, and I think they're pretty cool. We're going to be... We're going to read uh, two sections of Scripture. They're not going to be up here, but I want you guys to write them down. We're going to be in Joshua 5.13, or Joshua 5-ish. 
feel free to read the whole story, not just that one verse. That'd be great. And 1 Samuel 16 and 17. Chapter 16 and 17. We're going to go through two different stories here that I think kind of lay this out pretty nice for what, what the Lord kind of built in this message. So the definition today for us being activated in our identity, the definition for information is knowledge of what God can do. Say it with me. Knowledge Knowledge. of what God can do. That's information. And we can hear that a lot from a pulpit, right? We can hear that from a podcast. We can hear that from someone else's testimony. Who knows that's good? There's plenty of people that don't have a clue who God is or what He can do. But the information part that is very important in the activation process is the knowledge of what God can do. I believe that will only take you so far. That can provide a platform for you to stand on. Right? I can hear someone tell me about something that God's done in their life. And I can stand on that with them. But until I have a personal revelation for myself, I'm not going to be able to launch into the real glory to glory and and, and faith to faith that he's talking about. And so I promise you that he does want to provide that revelation for you. And the revelation is the understanding of what God is doing now. Right? Otherwise, we're reading this book as a history book. And a bunch of stories that don't apply to me. But I believe he's doing it right now. I believe that it's the same God that did these things. The same power that rose Jesus out of the grave actually lives inside of me. I believe that. Right now. Revelation is the understanding of what God is doing now. And the application portion, I believe this is the part that we leave out so often. We're quick to exit this this process before this part takes place. An application is the acceptance of personal responsibility in the process. Meaning I've, I've heard what God can do. I actually believe what God is doing right now. But I don't really want to have any personal responsibility for this thing. And so that revelation becomes pretty soon. It kind of shrivels down into information a little bit. Because you're leaving that place of revelation and it just dries up. That's good, man. It does. It, it means something until you don't do anything with it. Wow. Yeah. Revelation means something until you just don't do anything with it. And then the fourth one is activation. And this is what we all want. We all rose our hand. There were two people that didn't and I wrote your names down. <laughs> Activation is the result of your partnership with the Holy Spirit in the process. So you've heard what God can do. You've actually heard and believe what He's doing right now. You've actually chosen to take a step into the water and apply it to your life. And the result is going to be an activation because it's not about you. It's about what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Yeah. Right? Say that again. So we're never going to see the application if we don't apply it to our lives. Yeah. And I forgot what I said or I'd say it again, Scott. <laughs> I got it. Information, revelation, application, and activation. We're going to read. Well, you're going to listen to me read. And if you want to read along, you can. Joshua 4. This is a really cool story. Who knows about the, the parting of the Red Sea? Yeah. Right? Israelites went across the Red Sea. Who knows that they also went across the Jordan River like almost the exact same way? Yeah. Some people forget about that or they don't know about that or they haven't heard about that. But they came up. How many, how many of them was there? How many Israelites were there? There were millions, right? It like it's a nation. Yeah. A nation of people. Come on, guys. It's not a hundred people walking in the desert. This is... Mil- this is like, give me a city. Chicago? Dodge City, yeah. I'm saying an 8 million town 
yeah, anyway. L.A. is smaller than that, isn't it? I think. So anyway, bigger than L.A. walking through the desert. It's a lot of people. And they've come across the Red Sea, and they've, they're walking for 40 years out in the wilderness. And there's a moment when they come to the, the Jordan River, and it's the same thing. It's the same, oh, my goodness, there's water. <laughs> what are we going to do? And, of course, at this point, Moses is gone, and Joshua is leading them. And Joshua hears from the Lord that he's going to do it again. Say, do it again, God. Joshua hears from the Lord that he's going to do it again. And so he has them with the Ark of the Covenant. And it's very strategic. And who goes first? And ladies, and yeah, it's great. And they go through and they take that step in there. And it walls up on both sides. And I love where it says they walked on dry ground. That means that there's no moisture on the ground where they're walking. It's dry ground. That's a lot of, that's a miracle sponge. Walled it up. On both sides. And they walk through it the same way. Except this time, the Lord tells Joshua to have them go back and take stones from the middle of the the dry ground and to bring it on the other side. And to build this, this altar of remembrance. And they're like, why are we doing this for? Why can't we just keep going? What are we doing? The whole point of it was, the Lord told Joshua that one day your grandchildren are going to ask about, about this. What's going on with this? What are these stones for? And you're going to get to testify as to what God did. You're going to get to testify that, let me tell you about these stones. So that's proof right there that it's okay to stand on somebody else's testimony sometimes. You guys realize that you're living a life right now where your kids are watching everything you do, you parents? We get to testify to what God's doing. And I hope they stand on that. I believe my kids are going to stand on my testimony until they get to have their own encounter. My kids have had their own encounters. Praise Jesus. That's awesome. It's a good story. And I want to read real quick. This was the explanation. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. It's a testament to what God has done. It's a testament to how good God is. There's parts of this story that are just Really awesome. So they're facing Jericho when they come out of this Jordan River, and they're facing Jericho. Who knows that all the details on Jericho? Big place, big old thick walls. They ran chariots around the top of it. Amazing stature of a city, right? The Lord said that it's going to be theirs. So Joshua comes out. He's the leader. He's the warrior. He's the he's the power, the powerhouse on this team. And the Lord takes them from a place of information. They actually experienced some stuff that was really cool. But this is a really solidifying moment. This is the revelation part of this story for Joshua. And it's Joshua 5.13. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, Are you friend or are you foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. The triune God was standing right in front of this guy, sword in hand. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. I love that part. That's funny. It was Joshua's task, as it is ours, 
to not just know the commander's plans, but to know the commander. A lot of times we hear the voice of the Lord even, or we have counsel in our lives that tell us which way to go, and we act on it on faith, which we're called to do. But who knows that it's not just about those plans. It's about the commander of those plans. It was Joshua's task at that point. And that's why the Lord showed up to him. Hey, I need you to know that I'm standing here with a sword and it's all about me. And I'm about to lead this destruction of this city. And I'm about to make these walls come crumbling down. And it's not about you stepping out and obeying me. It's not about you grabbing the stones like I said and building an altar like I said. It's about me being really powerful. And he'll do that for you if your eyeballs are open and willing. When you step out of that Jordan River, when you step out of that circumstance, and the first thing you see is, is the Lord standing there on the other side? Pay attention. Because he wants to reveal something powerful to you. And that was an amazing revelation because we all know what happens with Jericho, right? The walls came tumbling down. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 16, there's another story. Who knows, who knows the story of David? David was a good old dude. Yeah, rapist, murderer, man after God's own heart. A rapist and a murderer and a man after God's own heart. He knew who he was, though. Amen? And the story of David is is not simple at all. King Saul was king of the people because they had to have a king. They didn't want to just have the Lord. They actually had to have a man in front of them. Right? It talks about that. The Lord kind of gave them an option. Like, we'll take uh, a man over you, over your guidance. And so God said, Okay, here you go. But during that time, Saul had really done some things that were just out of line with the kingdom and with the call on his life. And Samuel was called to go out and anoint someone else as king, right? He anointed David as king, the shepherd boy who was kind of forgotten by his whole family. I love the story. Samuel actually steps into Jesse's house and says, I'm supposed to anoint one of your sons as king. So he lines up, what, six of them? Lines up six brothers, and Samuel's like, it's not him, not him, not him. Samuel's a prophet, not him. You must have another son. The Lord told me to come here and anoint one of your kids, and it's not any of these. You must have another one. Oh, yeah, we have David. He's over there watching the sheep. We'll get him over here. He was the one. Samuel anoints him as king, and then David became king, right? He waited a long time. 17 years or so. But God was working that whole time. Soon after, he actually gets to stand in the palace and play the harp for the king because the king's being tormented. You know, God had to like prepare him. God had to like actually put David in the, the, temp, in the, the palace to prepare himself for what he was about to take over. Like there was a lot, of, a lot in this. The Lord's got a cool way of like putting stories together. And I like it a lot. I like it a lot. You have a story too. Did you know that? He's putting your story together right now. 1 Samuel 16, 13. It says, when he was anointed by Samuel, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. This was an important part of what David was about to do. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that point on. Who knows that The Spirit now has access to your innards. Yeah, He's actually inside of you now. He's not just upon you. He's not just with you. He's actually inside of you. He's got access to your insides, your heart, your gut. Say it with me. Spirit has access to my heart. He has access to my gut. Anybody ever gone with their gut? Followed their gut? Yeah, Spirit lives inside of you. He's got access to that. Obey your gut. But during that time when David was a shepherd and he was in the hills and he was watching the sheep, he had experiences. And the Lord was putting together 
quite a testimony for this young man. And there was times that he would fight bears and he would fight lions who would come and try to steal the sheep. And says he'd run up there and grab them by the, by the jaw and beat them to death with a club. Who's going to go for that? Anybody going to go for that? I grew up on a sheep farm. So I know, what, I know how stupid and stubborn sheep are. That lion can have him as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> David was a good shepherd. He was a good shepherd who went after the sheep. He went after the sheep when they went astray. And he fought them hand and tooth. Tooth and nail. Right? Fast forward to the time when Goliath comes out every single day. The Israelites are facing the Philistines. Say Philistines. Philistines. Israelites are facing the Philistines. They're lined up like they do. You ever seen those movies, the old movies, when they just line up and just load a gun and shoot each other? It's probably different than that, right? A little bit. His Israelites are lined up ready, and every day Goliath would come out, nine foot tall dude, huge spear, and he would yell insults at them and their God. Tell them that how small they are, how unpowerful their God is. And he would bait them for a fight, and every time they would run away in fear. Well, one of these times, David actually steps in because he's, he's bringing food to his brothers. And he actually hears the insults. Who in here loves the Lord so much that when somebody is mocking them, when somebody's mocking your family, the family of God, that something righteous mm, builds up inside of you? Something righteous builds up inside of you and you can do... There's, not a moment that you're going to let that happen. You're not, you're not going to let that pass. You're going to figure out what to do, yeah. right? And David stepped up and he said, so what's up with this guy and why is everybody running away? What are we doing here? Oh, yada, 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 yada. Excuse after excuse after excuse as to why we're doing nothing about this, right? And David says, I'll fight him. I'm ticked off enough. I've got enough fire in my bones. I have a relationship with the Lord. And he says, King Saul said, "Uh, that's not going to happen. You're just a a little boy. You're just a a young chap. You don't know enough about this. You're not experienced enough at this. Who's been there? Who's been told they don't have enough experience? Who's been told they haven't been through enough or they don't have enough knowledge or understanding? There's some kids in here too, huh? Listen up. The kingdom lives inside of you. It's accessible to you, young boys, young girls. And David knew that. And this is what David's response was. The same God that saved me from the claws of the lion and the claw of the bear is going to save me from this guy. He had an experience with the Lord. He actually became activated in his identity. And he knew who he was. And his stepping forward that day to face that giant, we all know the story, giant falls, David pulls out his his sword, chops his head off. That was his application moment. Are you with me? That was his moment of saying, you know what? I think that I've seen the Lord do enough things. I think I've heard about the things that the Lord can do and I actually believe it. And I'm sick and tired of what's going on right now. I'm sick and tired of my people being under this kind of bondage. I'm sick. So he wasn't just a shepherd to real sheep, was he? He was a shepherd to people at a very young age. And he cared enough about the sheep and the people that were called to be in his circle of influence at that time to rise up because he had seen God work. He had heard about this God and how powerful he was. And he'd actually experienced it. He had a platform to launch to the next glory and launch to the next faith. And he did something about it. And let me tell you about activation. Don't be fooled to believe that this life is just about you and that your story is just about you and that your experience is just about you. The moment that we start thinking it's just about me and all these things that I'm going through with the Lord or about me and my family, He doesn't do that just for you. 
He has a whole family that he cares for. And your moment of activation is not just for you. It's for a nation of people. It's for the whole family that you've been called to steward. And so that moment that he stepped up and he applied that to his own personal life and he chopped the head off the giant, it brought freedom not just to him, not just to his personal family, but to a whole nation. The Philistines ran away and the Israelites are like, I think this is our moment. And they rose up because somebody else rose up. And they went after it. And they plundered their tents. And they took all their treasure. And the Lord blessed them. Because one person realized, I think I'm going to apply what I know. I think I'm going to apply what I've heard. I'm going to apply what I've seen. And I'm going to believe that I can be a part of this process. Not just because I want to, but because the people around me need me to. There's a family of God that He cares about very much. There are people facing depression and you have gone through it. There are people that face anxiety and you've gone through it. You've seen God do it. There are people that are facing financial disaster and you're on the other side of that. There are people that don't know how to hear from the Lord. And you do. That might seem like a really small thing, but that's one of the early steps in this process. Hearing from the Lord is so important. It says, my sheep will hear my voice. Does it say maybe? Does it say if they've had a good day? Does it say if they practice really hard? It says, my sheep hear my voice is he your shepherd are you his dumb sheep (laughs) and I say that only from my past experience with sheep we are his sheep he deems us worthy to go after and he's leading you from a place of just hearing about your identity Hearing us talk about how you're a child of God. Hearing us talk about how you're worthy and you're valuable. The Lord actually desires to have a relationship with you. And to actually saying, you know what? I believe that. And maybe I'm in a place where I don't know what to do with it next. Find somebody. That's the benefit of a family. Raise your hand in here if you've heard the Lord's voice before that's amazing because there's still some people who haven't let's encourage people let's help get people from one glory to the next from one breakthrough to the next did you know that you're actually called to be more than a conqueror not just a one time conqueror not just victorious one time not just a survivor but to actually be victorious, to be victorious. Can we walk in victory together? Can we be a family of God who's activated in this? And we haven't just heard one too many sermons or worshiped to one too many songs or just huddled up in our house and have a little prayer meeting together as a family, which is very important. But we actually do something with it. And our eyes go beyond what we can see. Our eyes go go beyond what's right here, right now. And I have a heart for the people that God has put in my path. And that has not always been the case. There are plenty of times that it's super easy. Who can imagine how easy it is to get self-absorbed with stuff? Because we have our own junk and our own worries and our own stuff. This is a family of God thing. I promise. And it's time that we get activated in that. Who's willing to apply this little bit of information to your own life? Who's ready to apply this to your own life? Who's ready to believe that the Lord wants to speak to his kids? And that I can be a part of that process. Stand up with me. I want you to pick one person 
and go to them right now. Please step out of your comfort zone and go across the aisle if you have to. Grab one person, one person. I'm not going to be too pushy with this detail, but I want to challenge you right now to get uncomfortable. If you want the Holy Spirit, listen up. If you want the Holy Spirit to be in this, you may have to get uncomfortable so He can comfort this situation right here. Do you understand that? I'm not going to push you too much, but it's just the truth. What we're going to do is encourage each other and we're going to bless each other right now. What I believe that I can do in this moment right here is activate a spirit of prophecy in this place to where we can hear from the Lord and we can share that with somebody. And it's super simple. You know, prophecy is so much easier than you think it is. This isn't about some fortune teller with some Ouija board. That, that's, that's crap. That's junk. We're talking about heavenly access to a king that talks. Heavenly access to a king that wants to encourage you and wants to encourage you and wants to build you up and knows where you're at right now. I promise. So what we're going to do, and you can sit down now, but sit down with your, with your person. Okay, cool. Beautiful. Perfect. What we're going to do is spend very short amount of time asking the Lord what he would like to share with the person that you're with. And I promise you that you have so much access to the, the king's voice right now. And I promise you how easy it is to not believe that. That first voice you hear, if he really has access to your heart, let's trust it. Because that second voice is going to make you start questioning whether or not you heard the first voice the right way. And then that third voice is going to make you really question whether... Does that make sense? Let's make this quick and easy. The Lord has access to your hearts and access to your minds in Jesus' name. Ask the Lord real quick what He would like to share with your friend. And then when both of you are ready, share that thing. Go. Raise your hand if that was uncomfortable for you. Be real. Congratulations. That's called the kingdom life. Right? Don't be afraid of uncomfortable moments. And I promise you that if you continue to step out into those uncomfortable moments, you're going to hear the voice more clearly. The Holy Spirit's going to show up more and more and more with a big old smile on his face because you're ready to be activated in the kingdom to build up and encourage the family of God. Grab the hand of the person that's right with you, your partner, if you're with them still. Everybody stand up. Father God, we thank you for every moment that we get to be in your presence, for every moment that we get to be with our family, our brothers, and our sisters, Father. And we thank you for the courage and the boldness to spur each other on in faith and good works. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for those uncomfortable moments that you're teaching us to be okay with. Father, we, we accept the responsibility in this process. And we choose to step forward, whether it's prophecy, whether it's finances, whether it's selling your home, whether it's moving into a different town, whatever it is, Father, when we hear your voice clearly or when we don't, and we choose to step in faith, Father, we are applying that and we believe in the activation in the kingdom that's coming. We thank you for that. Bless your kids this week. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.